Charles B. Curtis is one of the most famous graduates of Boston University and of the Boston University Law School. He has served as the Deputy Secretary of Energy, the founding director of the Nuclear Threat Institute, the president of the United Nations Foundation, and in many other distinguished roles in the public and private sector. I sat down with him recently to hear his advice and thoughts for students and other people interested in energy policy, climate change, and the many issues that confront us on sustainability and national security. So Charlie, tell us about your undergraduate career and what made you go into law school? Um, I started as a lot of students come out of high school uh, who are uh, achieve well in chemistry and science. No, a lot of students don't. <laughs> well, a lot do, and, and that slots them in college. Uh, it slotted me in first chemistry and then in a pre-med, pre-dent program. And I got interested in a lot of other things uh, while I was uh, in college. I was chairman of the student council, vice president of the class, and things of that nature. And uh, I just decided that I really wasn't interested in the lab technical side of the science agenda. I was in, interested in the people agenda of society. So I applied to law school and ended up at uh, Boston University in 1962, which is ancient history to anybody who's watching this. <laughs> And what was BU like in 1962 and, and, and the law school? Well, the law school was located on um, uh, Beacon Hill, a uh, street over from the uh, uh, State House wow. uh, on Ashburton Place. And while the facility that now houses the law school here off of Commonwealth Ave and was being built, and we moved in to that facility in my second year. Ah. And so it was uh, a, an enormous contrast <laughs> in, in age of facility and location. Of course, we became part of the broader university community, much, much to the law school's benefit. Mm -hmm. And what was BU like in those days? Was Commonwealth Avenue you know, the bustling, trolley-filled danger zone that it is today? Uh, it, it was certainly trolley-filled and certainly a danger <laughs> zone. Uh, Boston traffic is world famous for a reason. <laughs> and, uh, uh, but uh, coming back to the campus today um, in 2019, uh, I'm just stunned by the built out of this university. Uh, and much of that accomplished after 1962. Uh, the law school itself occupied now the full building. It was originally the law and education tower. Uh -huh. And now it is of course just the law school. Mm -hmm. uh, and uh, building after building, it's overwhelming Kenmore Square as we speak. And uh, it's great to see. It's become, it's always been a great university and had enormously famous graduates. Um, Martin Luther King Jr. among them. Uh, but now it has the physical plant that speaks of its greatness. And uh, that's nice to see. Wonderful. What did, did you do anything in law school that foretold a career in energy or were you a generalist or were you a uh, soccer player or no, I was a swimmer? Uh, or? The most interesting and fateful uh, part of my law school experience is I ended up uh, very good friends with two of the women in our class. There were only five women in our class, our entry oh, class, class of... of graduated in 1965. Right, and how many total in that class? And about 170-something. Five women. Yeah, and five women. Uh, one, Fran Miller, um, uh, 
when graduated, uh, became a faculty member and invented the health practice that is so many uh, lawyers uh, are involved in in the country today. Uh, and another Mount Holyoke grad with her, Peggy Gill, uh, and Bill Cohen and I, by our second year, were uh, seated at, at together in every class that was common to us. And it was a, it was a fearsome force. Uh, it was a great experience for me. And I, th I think for them, of course, Bill Cohen went on to be a uh, member of the House, a U.S. Senator, and a Secretary of Defense and he's been a lifelong friend. Um, but he spent his life in public, per, in, in public service. Uh, but he was brilliant. He was a, a, a classics major at Bowdoin. And, uh, you know, Greek and Roman classics. And uh, so I was, you know, pre-med, pre-dent. <laughs> and, uh, um, it was maybe an unusual uh, partnership, uh, but it uh, was a terrific one. We were both on Law Review together, uh, and uh, the, that occupied, uh, for my second and third years, that occupied all available time <laughs> uh, other than uh, classwork. You know, there's this wonderful story about law school, they say the first year they scare you to death, the second year they work you to death, and the third year they bore you to death. <laughs> and uh, that never happened to me, fortunately. It, the first two years happened to me, <laughs> that, but I was not bored. That's wonderful. So um, were you editor of the Law Review or? I, or, or just, uh, we were all editors of the I Law see. Review. All members are editors of the Law Review. Bill was the note editor, and the notes are the um, more significant uh, uh, articles in mm -hmm. the uh, Law Review. I was the assistant note editor, and uh, it was... Uh, it was a good team. Wonderful. So the freshly minted law graduate from Boston University heads south to Washington, D.C. to the office of the Comptroller of the Currency? Well, Is I, that right? Bill and I went down to see if we could get a job. <laughs> and uh, I was, as I've already remarked here, impressed that uh, my science education had occupied such uh, a large amount of my academic life as an undergraduate that I knew nothing about economics and uh, or much of the traditional uh, liberal arts uh, uh, curricula. So I wanted to uh, work at Treasury and uh, I got a job with the controller of the currency, which is a bureau in the treasury that regulates the national banking system. Right. Banks are either state chartered or federally chartered. The federally chartered are called national banks or they have somewhere in their title N-A, uh, like Chase is mm -hmm. a, a national bank. Citibank is a national bank. And um, that was a very revolutionary time because the, the state banks were converting to national charters and Kennedy's uh, controller of the currency, Jim Saxon, was held over in Linda Johnson's administration because he was trying to open up competition in the uh, banking industry. And, uh, and he figured he needed lawyers to do that. So he hired a bunch of lawyers and fortunately I was one of them. That's great. And uh, how long were you there? And what I was there for two years. I went 
to the Army, uh, came back from active duty, and, uh, and then went over to the Securities Exchange Commission and, uh, and had a, a very interesting uh, learning process at the SEC. Well, tell us about it. Well, it's uh, Securities Exchange Commission was uh, born in the mid '30s uh, as part of the oh, New Deal. Part of the New Deal, and uh, it regulated the sale of securities to the public under the 33 Act, under the 34 Act, it regulated the trading markets. And uh, the trading markets uh, is uh, where I landed. So I would, became chief of the branch of uh, inspections and regulation in the division of trading and markets, and then the special counsel. And uh, at a time when the uh, trading markets were experiencing increasing volumes and they lost control of their books and records, the so-called back office function. Right. And a number of very prominent trading firms, uh, brokers and dealers, went bankrupt and the exhausted the New York Stock Exchange's emergency funds, which were 25 million in those days. And so uh, we ended up drafting legislation that became the Securities Investor Protection Act. That is the SIPC, S-I-P-C that you see today, that ensures customers' cash and securities deposited with uh, brokers and dealers. Um, that experience uh, uh, incited the Hill uh, Congress to rewrite the securities laws. And I was hired to do that in the House of Representatives. And uh, so I went up in 1971 and in 1973, the Yom Kippur War uh, happened and the ensuing Arab embargo, which a lot of people don't know, that embargo not only embargoed Arab oil shipments to the United States and Israel and others who aligned with Israel. But uh, that embargo precluded the use of Arab oil in the US Navy anywhere in the world. And uh, it had very uh, patent and uh, important national security implications right from the day one. Uh, the, uh, so I, uh, got involved in that as the new kid, uh, because there was no one in the house or the Senate that recognized energy as a separate subject. Uh, and so I got the energy jurisdiction and of course it became a focus of legislation for many years. Uh, I refer to it as the swamp <laughs> I was drawn into. That, that word's taken nowadays. Yeah, I know. It, maybe we were equally effective <laughs> with the swamp in those days as, as seems to happen today. Uh, but uh, can, can we back up, though, Charlie, sure. for a second and talk about the Arab oil embargo? Because now you've entered the world of energy, and that was a pivotal event in the history of American energy policy. Okay. And um, many, many folks who probably see, see this video won't know that and won't remember the fundamentals of that event. So can you remind well, us the of, fundamentals of what happened and to, in the energy world and the military world and then the economy? Sure. The, um at that time, we were importing a third of our oil uh, into the United States, and when the uh, and the Arabs quadrupled the price of oil in the world market, and thus in our imports from wherever they were derived—Canada, 
for example, followed the price increase that oh, uh, it gave rise to the uh, organization of producing uh, uh, states, OPEC, uh, that we hear about which even which today. Was a, which was a cartel. Is a cartel. It is a cartel that and, was then quite effective at controlling right. output, oil output and the price. Yeah, and, and th their economics are still stunningly better than anyone else. The lifting cost of in Saudi Arabia is still around 2 to $3 a barrel. So when it's competing with, let's just say, U.S. oil production is now around, we're pretty close to $50 a barrel cost to produce. So they have a lot of margin if they, uh, uh, competitive margin if they wish to use it. They don't wish to use it. Uh, they did for a while, but it was unsuccessful and they needed the money. So they uh, went back to their, their uh, cartel prices. Um, anyway, the, theory, the, the importance of that is uh, we were deprived of oil. The world uh, oil that we were, did have access to quadrupled in price. Uh, we had long gasoline lines. Uh, you could only f get five gallons uh, uh, at, at any gasoline station. So we adopted national rationing. So the first time it printed out ration. We never distributed them, but printed out ration stamps. But it rippled through the economy. So we had double-digit inflation and double-digit unemployment. A colorful term, stagflation, was invented. Uh, but it was a very serious blow to the economy. Uh, farmers, for example, could not acquire the petroleum product they needed to harvest their crops. And uh, so it impacted from field to inner city like nothing else in, as a blow to our economy. Right. So big picture, what did the federal government do in response to this and what was your place in, in, in that committee? Well, it's a long story. <laughs> the, uh, first of all, interestingly, when the Yom Kippur War occurred, um, the, uh, the Nixon administration was in the middle of uh, the Watergate conflict. And so, and they were as prepared as the Congress was to address energy policy. John Ehrlichman was the president's, quote, energy advisor. For history students, they'll figure that out. I don't have to go into that detail. We had wage and price controls in effect under the Economic Stabilization Act. And the Economic Stabilization Act had health and uh, petroleum prices and, and products uh, were under price and allocation controls. So what the Congress did was to try and moderate uh, and gradually increase those prices uh, it, over a relatively short period of time uh, from $2.40 a bar uh, barrel to over uh, $11 in Jimmy Carter's administration. Uh, that was, trans resulted in an enormous transfer of wealth from the northern states to the southern states and fractured the Democratic majority uh, and, uh, and uh, penalized Carter, uh, Carter's chances for re-election. He was not re-elected. And that's when Ronald Reagan entered the scene right. in 1980. So, uh, election. And uh, the, uh, the other thing that was done, and most important, were fuel efficiency standards, right turn on red. Every time you stop at a red light and turn red, that was because of the energy oh, crisis. Well, the Department of Energy was established in the, the federal Department government of for the first time was established, ever. Right. And in Cong and 
so Congress passed all these this legislation. Right. And what was your role when all as all this was well, happening I, I, on in the, on the committee? I was the lead energy counsel in the House, and so um, all of that legislation uh, uh, was written, almost all of it in in under. Uh, my supervision at that time. And so I say almost all of it because there were important elements uh, in uh, the uh, in public lands, uh, leasing, public lands leasing, mm -hmm. and uh, that were not uh, in the committee's jurisdiction. And, and those, uh, the EPA had just been formed in 1970. Mm -hmm. And uh, it would go on to uh, have more influence on the production, transportation, and use of oil and natural gas uh, and, and energy resources than the Department of Energy, as a matter of fact. Uh, Jim Schlesinger became the first secretary the old Federal Power Commission was being phased out uh, and consolidated into the Department of Energy, but still made quasi-independent. And uh, I was, I had left at the end of uh, 1977 to form a law firm. Well, before we go there, can right. we just close out your legislative career? Tell us a, a couple of the bills that we recognize that were, were written under your purview. Uh, you mentioned the Appliance Standard Act. That was a federal piece of federal legislation. Yeah, the, the, um, the major bills were the Petroleum Allocation Act of 1973. That's where the Congress took over the wage, uh, the, uh, sorry, the oil, pricing and allocation controls right. and product controls from the uh, um, energy, uh, uh, from the Economic Security Act jurisdiction. Then the Congress passed the Energy Policy and Conservation Act 75. That was the major bill. That had everything in it including the efficiency standards, uh, emergency powers, and um, of course the Department of Energy Organization Act was in 1977. And after that passed, I, uh, um, well, I, I had left at the, in January of 77 after, uh, Carter was elected and uh, because I had spent uh, three, four Christmas seasons in a row uh, on the floor of the house <laughs> until two or three o'clock in the morning. There were some wild scenes and all that. I, I, I'm uh, sure of that, yes. The, uh, and so and we did rewrite the securities laws and that took until, until 1975. And, Toxic Substances Act and the uh, uh, Children's Sleepwear uh, uh, Protection Act. And so oh. there are a lot of things that also uh, was part of the agenda. And 1977, as you left the legislation <clears throat> to establish the Department of Energy was um, under discussion. Right. And, you, and that's when you, uh, with, and, and that legislation is also what created the Federal Energy Regulatory Commission out of the Federal Power Act and all of that. So it was under discussion, not yet finished, and you uh, decided to take a Christmas off. Well, it's, <laughs> uh, I, I was a little burned out, I'll admit, and uh, the chief counsel of the Senate uh, Energy Natural Resources Committee and I, and the House and the General Counsel of the Senate Commerce Committee and the Chief Counsel of the Senate Permanent Investigations Committee formed a law firm. And uh, it was uh, 
I had a six month run <laughs> in the law firm. And uh, Jim Schlesinger, the first secretary of the department asked me to come in and chair for the transition, the Federal Power Commission, and then the Federal Energy Regulatory Commission that was born under that act. So maybe you could explain why there was a transition of two organizations that sound pretty much identical, um, the Federal Power Commission, the Federal Energy Regulatory Commission, and what what you did and, and the, uh, what, you know, how that came to be. Well, the Federal Power Commission was uh, born in 1925. It was originally occupied by three cabinet secretaries. And it did uh, licensing of hydro facilities. And, uh, and these were the years in which the great expansion in the West was taking place. And uh, then in the 30s, it got jurisdiction over interstate transmission and sales of electricity and natural gas transmission in interstate commerce and sales. Um, and that agency uh, pursued a command control form of regulation uh, through its uh, uh, long uh, days. And uh, it was estimated that they had a, a, and a backlog agenda of cases that would last for 50 years. So when that jurisdiction was brought into the Department of Energy, uh, the Congress decided that they wanted to introduce more competition into that market. And so they uh, created a successor agency with uh, uh, a broader set of powers, including some review powers of the Secretary of Energy, uh, because the Congress wasn't quite, quite sure they trusted Jim Schlesinger <laughs> with all that power. Um, and uh, so I, I chaired the Federal Power Commission for only three months, and then the Federal Energy Regulatory Commission uh, in which we basically set about delegating decisional responsibility and exempting out aspects of that jurisdiction from regulation. It had gotten to the point that uh, in my first year, the commission was asked to make t over 20,000 decisions. Uh, they all came to the commission table and uh, it was easy to see this was nuts. <laughs> so we, we undid it, but it didn't take great insight. <laughs> Can you tell us the story of the, the, the night that the Federal Power Commission had to transition to become the Federal Energy Regulatory Commission? Well, that's a surprising question that you know there's anything about that night that was interesting. Um, Don Smith was the... Uh, vice chair of the commission. He was a transferring federal power commissioner to the Federal Energy Regulatory Commissioner. Don, now I was chairman, okay? Don set up a big beer blast <laughs> in the commission meeting room, which was, uh, um, I'll have to be frank to admit, <laughs> I did not know what to do about it. <laughs> So in any case, that was the, the last days when they moved into this new building. Um, the, uh, this is one of these private uh, builds uh, for the government. Uh, they asked the Federal Power Commission staffs, what type of facilities would you like in the building, all right? And so when I got to the commission, there was a bank a cleaners, a cocktail lounge, and a liquor store in the building on the first floor. 
Uh, we had two bank robberies in the first uh, year and a half I was in that building. And uh, it was an exciting time. <laughs> and and, and there, the Federal Energy Regulatory Commission is in yet a different building now. <laughs> Much more serious and nice. Uh, but wasn't it necessary for Don to resign in order to swear you in? There wasn't there some sort of no, personal do jujitsu at midnight? I, I thought I had heard. No, I that. had Irv Pollock uh, of the uh, Securities Exchange Commission swear me in uh, at, uh, and that, uh, no, there wasn't a jujitsu. <laughs> okay. There may have been a jujitsu, but it had nothing to do with me. <laughs> <laughs> um, oh, great. So you were at the commission just as its first chairman for how long? Oh, uh, for three and a half years. And, and uh, what were the major developments? You're a brand new commission. What was different about what you were doing than what the Federal Power Commission was well, doing? Well, with, with the Congress amended the uh, Natural Gas Act, we had to implement that. And Meaning an, uh, allow competition for the yes, first time? Yes, allow competition. For the first time and, in natural and gas And break the impasse between intrastate jurisdiction and interstate jurisdiction. And they federally regulated wellhead prices throughout the nation. They invented terms like stripper gas wells. Uh, nobody knew what that was, but they wanted to give them a higher price for low producing gas wells. Um, in any case, uh, that was very complicated. The, uh, the other thing, we set up a system of reports the uh, CCH was not reporting on the commission uh, because every time they asked the lawyers whether they would buy CCH reporting, they'd said no because they had their own <laughs> copies of all the decided decisions and no one else did. So, uh, so we, uh, we paid CCH to report on the commission wow. uh, for, uh, for three years and after that, they had a, a well-established uh, clientele. Um, the, uh, but the most important thing probably was the entry of uh, small power production, competition in the production of electricity, uh, which were renewables and, uh, and uh, small power producers and co-generators. Uh, that could sell into the market without becoming at an electric utility and regulated as such. This was the law known as PURPA. That's right. right. It's Public Utility Regulatory Policies Act. And that, through several iterations, is the driver behind wind penetration, solar, and enormous cogeneration, uh, combined cycle, uh, natural gas, and ultimately the displacement of coal, which is occurring now per force of market mm -hmm. uh, uh, forces rather than regulatory right. obligation. Right. Uh, so that, that was revolutionary, and that was, uh, Jimmy Carter deserves a lot of uh, credit for that, that uh, he bought into it, and Almost nobody knows it. <laughs> right. So PURPA was 1978, and the commission right. was probably very busy, inherited the implementation of all the rules coming from that legislation. Congress gave you the job of implementing the rules, rules of the road for... Yeah. The, it, it's a kind generators. word, implementing. It, it, Congress does not write rules. They say, you go to write the rules. Right. <laughs> That's implementing, right? <laughs> And so um, it was a big job. I thought that was delegating. No, <laughs> it was a big job. Uh, and it was fun. Great. Uh, so in 1981, that's when you, you left the commission and yes. went back to the practice of law? Yeah, that was a little bit, uh, uh, Ronald Reagan gave me that opportunity. <laughs> because when Reagan came in, 
uh, I was held an appointment from a Democratic president. And uh, so they were all ordered out. And uh, now as a commissioner, I could have stayed, but not as chairman. Right. The chair serves at the pleasure of the president. Exactly. The commissioners have fixed terms that the president right. can't. Yeah. Affect. And I had, I was in a, in a second term and I had like three years left on that term. So, uh, so I went into, uh, back to my law firm and uh, ironically, um, uh, my practice was largely derived from my sec securities work. I represented the American Institute of Certified Public Accountants, Price Waterhouse, and uh, I also uh, uh, obviously developed a practice in uh, small power production and uh, the PURPA. Uh, really uh, the, the PURPA uh, revolution that that, was, that, that started, um, which, which was a fun practice. And, uh, and that occupied me for to 14 years, 13, 14 years. Firm built out, I think it's right now the largest energy and environmental practice in Washington. Still there, yeah. Van Ness Feldman, yeah. And uh, so that I, uh, Clinton was elected. Uh, the government was always the preferred client, and so I went back in. Some of my friends uh, used to kid me it's a triumph of uh, um, over experience, uh, uh, hope over experience, <laughs> and. Uh, um, and I got drawn into a completely different set of issues and experiences. It was right after the end of the Cold War mm -hmm. and uh, the breakup of the Soviet Union. And there were one thing about the Department of Energy that a lot of people don't know is that it's the greatest physical science enterprise in the world. It has now 17 operating laboratories, so-called national laboratories. And uh, they, uh, among their responsibilities, it's the um, steward responsibilities of safety and uh, performance of the nuclear weapons, right? Uh, that of this country, which is still a central part of the national security uh, profile of this country. Um, and that Jim Schlesinger, who had been a chairman of the Atomic Energy Commission, uh, pulled into the Department of Energy because he wanted that enormous science and technical resource available for the department's energy mission. And uh, Ernie Moniz, I have to say, made full uh, uh, the development of that capacity in service of a broader agenda of issues, and most importantly, the environment and climate change. Right. Um, so that seeds were set for the department's role in dealing with what I, I believe today is uh, in addition to uh, uh, avoiding a nuclear war, uh, the greatest challenge of catastroph catastrophic proportion to our, in the world, right. our society and the world's, and that's climate change. Right. And uh, yes. So can we back up just a little bit? H how is it that you became deputy secretary because lots of people would try and almost all of them fail. Uh, well, I didn't try. I was asked originally to be deputy and I said no. And my experience in Washington is if you say no, then they really want you. <laughs> and so 
This is why we're talking to you today. Get this, get <laughs> so, these pearls of wisdom. So in any case. Um, Someone called you. I, I had turned it down. And uh, the uh, Hazel O'Leary, who had been nominated to be uh, the uh, Secretary of Energy, had called me, asked me to be her deputy. I, I knew her well. And uh, I said, um, I said no because I uh, frankly didn't feel particularly qualified to take on the science and the national security side of that house, which is really not a side. It's like 90% of the house. Mm -hmm. And, uh, and then uh, she asked me again uh, to take the undersecretary job. And by that time, I couldn't stay out of government. So I went in and uh, the, uh, and I'm glad I did. Uh, so it was, uh, I got to go to a lot of strange places in uh, Russia and the former Soviet Union because we are trying to gather back the weapons and the uh, fissile materials, plutonium, highly rich uranium that were distributed throughout uh, the former Soviet Union to Russia and hold them secure uh, from theft and particularly the risk that a subnational group uh, would get a hold of these most world's most dangerous weapons or the means to make them. And uh, that was something that our laboratories, as it turns out, uh, were uh, the key uh, influencers on the Russians uh, to, because science, scientists, I'd say as a group, respect each other. Mm -hmm. But the group of their scientists that had lived in secret cities uh, for the duration of the Soviet Union, when they were doing this work, uh, and our scientists that were doing this work, uh, knew each other by reputation and name, but of course had never met. And so we started a science exchange with them and then built on that, what a program we call Lab to Lab, which lent uh, our expertise and equipment to securing the weapons and materials in the Russian Federation and in the former Soviet Union. And the, uh, the scientist who pulled that off on both sides uh, performed a great heroic service. Uh, it worked. And on the Russian side in particular, they don't have definitions of what's classified or not. So the Russian scientists took a great chan chance that they could be accused of traitorous acts at any given time. And of course, our scientists uh, were unsupervised over uh, in the Russian Federation and the former Soviet Union. So we took the risk that there would be communication of secrets that could imperil our security. So both the US and the Russian Federation and so several of the former Soviet states took enormous risk to work together and deal with a danger that they understood better than anyone, uh, the risk that was present in loose nuclear weapons and materials that can make nuclear weapons. It was the most interesting, challenging work that I was ever involved in, so. Right, um, I, I remember that vaguely um, from when I was at the department with you. Um, are any other activities at the, at the, at the department? Uh, I mean, I do recall you as the number two the, the tradition is the deputy secretary pretty much has to run the whole department because the secretary is called into yeah. 
cri national crises, traveling, advising the president, and a bunch of other things that are externally facing while someone has to run the, the major initiatives of the department. Well, the department had a, at that time a well-deserved reputation for dysfunction. So <laughs> the, uh, the operational side of the department was a great challenge. And, uh, and remained so, I'd say, throughout my tenure. Um, it was a lot of good people, spent a lot of sincere effort, uh, but it was, in, again, I'm gonna give you a complicated answer. In my view, it is largely the fault of the Congress, okay? And the Congress was appropriating uh, money in very, very small packages and in different colors. And if you wanted to change the color or uh, spend another package uh, at the same time, it was prohibited. And so it made management of the enterprise infinitely complicated and uh, wasn't for want of trying to get the appropriation process to change that. Uh, now the Department of Defense has more of the Congress's confidence and therefore it has more latitude. Uh, but the Department of Energy did not have the Congress's confidence. And so that continued throughout my tenure and that was something, probably one of my biggest disappointments that I couldn't make any progress in that. Uh, but it's, it's a serious issue when the power of the purse is exercised that way. Mm -hmm. I had a $19 billion agency and I could not move $2 million during the fiscal year to a different identified issue or opportunity without going and getting the approval of four committee chairmen in the House and the Senate and four ranking minority members in the House and the Senate. Needless to say, that was hard to do. Yeah, yeah. So just one more um, sort of undertaking at the Department of Energy. This was the first administration ever to adopt anything that we would call a climate change policy. In fact, the very first climate, national climate change action plan happened under your watch. Do you, do you, what do you remember about that and how it ties to all the, the concern that we have today about the issue? Well, it, it, it occurred under my watch, but I'll be frank to say, I watched it, okay? <laughs> I did not author that initiative. That was really uh, a staff-driven initiative. Mm -hmm. the, the staff was way ahead of the so-called leadership and uh, and you can take a lot of pride and credit for that. Uh, you and, and others, but you primarily, and the work you did in energy efficiency is the same way. The leadership was, well, one thing, the, the legislation had provided the authority, and so it was an implementation challenge. In, energy efficiency uh, standards for appliances. Mm -hmm. um, at one point, the Congress, you'll recall, uh, withdrew any uh, appropriations that would be used in promulgating a energy efficiency standard. So that was the type of Congress we were working under. I worked in the Congress for six years. I, I left with great respect for the institution and the people in the institution. Um, at that time, uh, there was a lot of bipartisanship, a lot of problem solving, sincere efforts to advance the country's interest. Uh, we didn't have any of, uh, e even when I was last in the Department of Energy, which is already 21 years or more ago, um, uh, maybe more, uh, the, uh, um, the Congress was not divided the way it is today. 
this is, I believe, a great challenge to our values and to the recovery of our essential forms of constitutional government. And uh, right. I, I, I would be remiss if I didn't say that uh, the career I've spent in and out of government, in and out of the practice of law, uh, in looking back, uh, I faced uh, a lot of opportunity, uh, but today's challenges are for good government and good practice are much greater than I had to deal with. Yeah. So the challenge is there. You know, I'd say one thing that might be relevant is in my checkered career, as we have talked, uh, I found the most important thing to do, and I believe this sincerely, is to improve your options. Uh, luck played an extraordinarily important role in my life. It doesn't in everybody's life. But because I concentrated on improving my optionality, if you will, the with a curious mind and, uh, uh, and taking advantage of learning, uh, when those opportunities presented themselves, I could take them. And so, you know, 60%, I think the figure is, of law grads never practice law. And yet I think they'd all tell you that their education was invaluable because really it's a, it's a teaching of the disciplines of logic and, uh, and how to think about a problem and how to solve problems. And just a scientist, multidisciplinary work in our laboratories is what really sets them apart. And in our universities, what you're doing in the Institute is what sets it apart. Drawing university-wide resources, most of the serious problems in life and science and in, and in uh, climate uh, require multidisciplinary contributions to the solution. Right. And that's a different model. Right. And yeah. it's extraordinarily important uh, I believe, to uh, recognize in what needs to be done in education and what needs to be done in approaching problems that we understand are complex. And if we can't easily see solutions, we tend to conclude they're just too complex and wait for technology to save us. And hopefully, uh, technology will play a major role in climate, but it's going to require other disciplines than just those that science can produce. Right. If I could get your reaction to one thing that, that struck me about the first Climate Change Action Plan, recognizing that you didn't author it, but you were there basically administering it, the ingredients of that first plan remain the pillars of most climate planning today. Yes. Um, there were converting uh, electric utilities to renewable energy and energy efficiency programs and solar R&D investments. And it would read, uh, I think, surprisingly like the climate plans we put out today. I think that's right. I, I but it's um, what was done in Paris, uh, I think, was the product of uh, a broad state understanding. There were 195 states that came together on that accord, the Paris Accord, that validated the climate issue and understood from 
the planning models that had been developed, uh, what needed to be done. They had different means for, and opportunities to do those things. And that was the genius of the accord, is that it asked the states to do what they could within their own means and political systems. But what they needed to do was generally agreed. And it was generally agreed because of things like that climate challenge that was developed uh, uh, in, in the uh, first Clinton term uh, in the uh, mid 90s. And so it, we, it's not for want of understanding uh, the path that we must be on. Mm -hmm. It is, uh, it's the will to take it. And in some cases, the courage to take it. And if we can get some technical assistance along the way, that would, like a rope, <laughs> that would be good. And so mission innovation, which was part of the Paris Agreement, mm -hmm. uh, was a, I think, a stunning achievement. I think there are 22, 24 states now signed up to mission innovation. And that's basically to use an increasing part of their available fiscal needs in who invest in uh, focused research and development and basic science uh, to in ways that hopefully can together provide uh, technical paths uh, and assistance that will uh, take us to a better place. That's wonderful. Let's wrap up with your your fourth or fifth career, which okay. was in um, the UN Foundation and the Nuclear Threat Institute. Yeah, this, this probably uh, not good. At, at the age of 60, I decided that I was not really that interested in building another law practice. I had gone to Hogan and Hartson out of the government uh, when I left, and it's a great law firm, but uh, I decided I want to do something different. And uh, that something different became the executive director of the United Nations Foundation, which was administering Ted Turner's billion dollar gift to the United Nations. You just can't give them money. You've got to uh, uh, get approval from the United Nations for anything you want to fund quite sensibly because you don't want just rich people to come in and right. start uh, telling the United Nations what to do, all right? And, uh, and while I was there, Ted Turner decided that he wanted to do something about nuclear weapons. And I got him together with Sam Nunn, even though Sam Nunn had been 24 years a senator from Georgia and 16 years the chairman of the Senate Armed Services Committee, Ted Turner, who had based CNN in Atlanta, didn't really know him. And uh, of course, I had worked with Sam Nunn when I was at the Department of Energy because he was the principal together with Senator Dick Luger from Indiana. Sam Nunn was the, and Dick were the principal sponsors of the Cooperative Threat Reduction Act, which provided the authority and the funding to do all the work that needed to be done in Russia and the former Soviet Union. And uh, so I had worked with him and knew how he expressed the threat. And, uh, and as I said to Ted, there are closer snakes <laughs> that you need to know about. And so Ted agreed that, well, he'd sponsor a study to see if a private, well-funded private organization could do anything about these things. And 
I led that study and you know, of course it, it concluded that in the affirmative. <laughs> and uh, so together with uh, Sam Nunn and Ted Turner, I was the founding president of the Nuclear Threat Initiative, which is now uh, approaching its 20th year uh, yeah. in existence. And I, I stayed there, passed the torch to uh, Joan Rolfing. Uh, interesting point. Um, when we set up the United Nations Foundation, we had six vice presidents. Two later on went, went on to be ambassadors, and one went on to be the commissioner of the Food and Drug Administration. And, but they were all women. Six officers, they were all women. It was extraordinarily successful organization and uh now, now led by ernie moniz our, our ernie moniz came uh, and i i was drawn back into nti to help with the transition two days a week uh, but uh which i'm still doing and uh it's uh it's very hard to leave this subject because it's quite arresting when you understand the dangers that uh, nuclear weapons, the, the, the risk of use, whether by intention or accident or miscalculation of our nuclear weapons, chemical or biological weapons uh, in the world are really a clear and present danger. We are, we've gotten lazy. Uh, we were very, very careful during the Cold War, but we were very lucky at the same time. Mm -hmm. And now we are not very, very careful. Mm -hmm. uh, so it's, uh, once you understand the peril and uh, the risk of this stuff getting into the hands of subnational groups or terrorists, um, it's, it's uh, hard to leave it. So that's what I'm doing. And, all right, well, why don't we close with this question, which is if you were giving advice to someone thinking about becoming a lawyer, um, whether it's in securities law or energy law or climate change, even nuclear uh, security issues, what's your advice? For would, you, would you do it? Oh yeah, I, 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 I think it's, it wasn't, I've had unique experiences, but these challenges are not in any stretch of the imagination uh, dealt with uh, to a satisfactory extent. And so I would, as an undergraduate, I would, take more courses uh, out of uh, a concentrated area if I could. I still today have regrets that I didn't take economics. And uh, the, uh, and, and increase your optionality. I mean, don't lock yourself in. Uh, and take some chances that luck might come your way. And, uh, and the law, the law is still, uh, it's a jealous mistress as it's uh, once described. Mm -hmm. It's, uh, it, it'll capture you, uh, but it is, it, it's a, a discipline that is very, very useful to a lot of different different expressions of economic activity. And uh, you mentioned Ernie Moniz. He says something of his time at the Department of Energy and of the time he's now spending at the Nuclear Threat Initiative is that he's a problem solver. 
And so I, what I'd say is work on solving problems. Uh, it's very satisfactory work. It's great. Well, thank you, Charlie. All right. Wonderful. All right. <laughs> Thanks, Peter.